Since man's fall, we have seen how God pointed man toward one source. And not like what Brother Slee said this morning. It's the blood plus nothing. Amen? It's not the blood plus baptism. It's not the blood plus being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. It's not the blood, oh God forbid, it's not the blood plus your works. Amen. Oh, without Jesus, we are nothing. We can do nothing. And the blood is the most important thing. You, I, I asked you this question when we started. How important is the blood? Well, if you don't have that for your foundation, anything that you build, you build in vain. And we found over in the Garden of Eden whenever Adam and Eve fell and they messed up and they disobeyed God's Word, we find that the glory of God departed from them and that they began to cover themselves with the fig leaves and that wasn't enough. God said, no, that's, that's not going to work. We find the first animal sacrifice. So we find from the very beginning there in the Garden of Eden that God pointed toward the blood of Jesus. The next thing we looked at, we looked at Cain and Abel. How that they both brought offerings to the Lord and how that Abel's offering was accepted because it was a blood sacrifice, Brother Sleece, and that Cain, even though he had good intentions, amen? Listen, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, amen? I've heard that before. I'll share that with you. A lot of people who meant good went to hell. A lot of people who mean good today are on their way to hell. A lot of good people. Like I said, if you compare them to, to uh, if you looked throughout Egypt and we looked at the Passover last week and how that the blood of the Lamb was on the doorpost, if you went by good people, some of the Israelites wouldn't have made it out alive. We find that out because once they get into the wilderness, they're like us. They mumbled and they grumbled and they complained and they even cussed the preacher. Amen? So we know they were not perfect, so it was not because of that that they were spared. They were spared because the blood of the Lamb, according to the obedience of God's Word, had been applied to their house. And when God came through there, when judgment made its way through the land of Egypt, when He saw the blood, He passed over them. Amen? Amen? Got ahead of myself a little bit because after Cain and Abel, we talked about the ark, Noah and the ark. And those of you out there, you thought that was just a kid's Bible story, didn't you? God showed us a perfect picture of how there's only one way of escape. Oh, then in Noah's, in Noah's day, it was the ark that he built according to the, to the specific instructions that God gave him. And today, <clears throat> the impending judgment that is about to come the clouds that are on the horizon, there's only one escape for you today. And that's not your religion. That's not your beads. That's not your priest. That's not your doctrine. That's not your church. That's the blood of Jesus plus nothing. No other way to escape the judgment that is to come. And we found how that there in Egypt, whenever they took the lamb, and it had to be a male lamb, it had to be without spot, without blemish, we find out that even down to the very detail of the time of day they were to sacrifice it, God had that plan. We find that they take a hyssop bush and they put it over the doorpost and out of all of the ten plagues, there had been nine before this, but this would be the one. God told Moses, He said, this will be it. This is the last plague. I will bring one more plague. Be ready to go when this one comes because it's time for me to deliver my people. And He would show us how that out of all of His mighty works, and God can do a lot of great things. Amen? Nothing too small for, nothing too big for God, nothing too small for God, nothing impossible for God, but only through the blood would He bring His people up out of the land of Egypt. And we find that they are delivered out of the heavy hand, out from under the heavy hand of Pharaoh in bondage there. And then we find them going out in the wilderness. If you're going down through, through the, your Bible there in the Old Testament, we will find in the book of Exodus, the 25th chapter, God's not through showing us and showing them a picture of the Redeemer to come. See, God testified to Adam and Eve in the garden when He said the woman's seed would bruise the head of the serpent's seed. Amen? Talking about the virgin birth then. Whenever He said, in not, in not words but in actions, that their fig leaves were not good enough, so He took and clothed them with coats of animal skins. So all throughout the Word of God, we are, we are seeing pictures, types, and shadows of that which Jesus would fulfill. God would speak to Moses in the Exodus, the 25th chapter, beginning in the first verse. It says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
speaking to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for, the, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod, in the breastplate. Verse 8, still in Exodus, the 25th chapter. He says, And let them, don't miss this this morning, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. We find with Moses, just as we found with Noah, just as we found with Adam and Eve, just as we found with Cain and Abel, God gave specific instructions on how things had to be. There would be no other way than God's way. If you think today you can make it, some other way you are badly mistaken and you will suffer the consequences of your ignorance because there's only one way to get from here to glory and that's by way of the cross and the blood of Jesus. No other way. You can't do it because you're good enough. You can't do it because of your religion. You can't do it because of your good works. Only through the blood will you make it to glory. And we find God here giving Moses specific instructions for the tabernacle that He would have them to build in the wilderness. And I set this up here today and I hope it doesn't offend anyone. Believe it or not, I got an email from somebody not long ago. Actually, it was a message. But anyway, they were offended because we had this hanging in our sanctuary. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I said, well, it's only hanging there for one reason. And that's to show us the picture and the shadow of, that you can find in the Old Testament tabernacle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's still hanging in here. And I thought to myself, if that's the only thing you can pick at, we must be doing pretty good. Amen. If you have to go to picking at the pictures that we've got on the wall. Hallelujah. <clears throat> anyway, God would have Moses. He would give him specific instructions for all of the, not just the furniture in the tabernacle, but the layout of the tabernacle as well. Do you notice anything uh, particularly uh, peculiar about the layout of the tabernacle and the furniture thereof? It's laid out in the form of a cross. Amen. Oh, my, that, that tickles me. Amen. If I didn't go any farther, that, there's enough for me. I guess I'm just a simple old country boy. But the first piece of furniture, we could spend weeks on each one of these pieces of furniture. But the first thing that God told them to build was a brazen altar. That's the first piece of furniture you would see whenever you went into the tabernacle of the Old Testament. You would see the brazen altar. That was the place, Brother Sleaze. Now see, we're looking at the shadows and the pictures that these things show us and they represent Jesus Christ. How that we can see Jesus mm -hmm. in all of this. Mm -hmm. And just as we did in the Garden of Eden, just as we did with Cain and Abel, just as we did with the Ark of the Covenant, just as we did, uh, not the Ark of the Covenant, Noah's Ark, just as we did with the, uh, the uh, uh, blood there in Egypt, the blood of the Lamb that they put on the doorpost, we're going to see this in the tabernacle that God would have them to lay out. Each piece of the tabernacle we can find Jesus in in a hundred different ways. So there's no way that we can cover all of this, but we'll touch on each piece just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The brazen altar, that was the place where what took place? The sacrifice. The blood. This is the place where the lamb would be brought and sacrificed. The first place you couldn't go. There's no way to go any farther in this, in this uh, tabernacle that God would lay out except first the blood was offered. Do you get that today? Yeah, Brother Billy, as to where they was talking about that, that's not a picture. That's an illustration. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, it's that it's, might have been what they were right. talking about, but this is an illustration. Right. That's exactly what it is. An illustration of how that you find Jesus in the layout of the tabernacle. And every piece, and this would be the very first piece you would find, would be this is where the fire would consume the sacrifice. This would be the brazen altar, the place where the lamb would be brought so in order to go any farther in this tabernacle that God had Moses lay out, you must first come by way of the blood. And the brazen altar there represented the place of sacrifice. The place where the lamb would be offered. I don't have to go to these scriptures. I can just give them to you. We talked about these before. John 1 and 29, John the Baptist would say, Behold, 
the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So we know that Jesus Christ was God's Lamb. We know that Jesus Christ was the sacrificial offering for the sins of man. We know that sin required death, Sister Vonnie. And we know that forgiveness required blood. Amen. Oh, thank God today for the sacrifice that Jesus made. He took our penalty. Amen. The next piece of furniture that we would see there is the water laver. This is the place where the priest would wash. This water laver would be made out of material that would cause it to be, if you walked up to it, it would look like a mirror. You would see your reflection in it. It would be the same as if you walked up and looked in a mirror today. So the priest, whenever he went up to that and he washed himself, he could tell whether he got washed good, whether he didn't get washed good. But this would represent the washing of the water of the Word. Jesus, the Word, in the flesh. The Bible would say the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Ephesians 5 and 26 would say that He might sanctify and cleanse it, speaking of His church, with the washing of the water for the Word. Now we find in the outer court, we find the brazen altar where the sacrifice is made. And we see Jesus in that. We see in the outer court the water laver. And we see Jesus in that. Jesus Himself told the woman at the well, I am the living water. Amen? I am the water of which I speak to you. This water that you drink today, you drink of it and you'll thirst again. But if you take the water that I'm giving you, if you drink of me, the living water, you'll never thirst again. So we see Jesus in the water laver. Oh, as plainly as we can see Him in the Lamb that was sacrificed there in Egypt during Passover. And you would go from the outer court to the inner court, which was called the holy place. And you would find the table of showbread. It would be right here. This is the table of showbread, which represented the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The manna that came down from heaven, that represented Jesus as well. We find that He is the bread. Amen? So this table of showbread, you don't have to really dig very far to find a picture of Jesus in that. He is the bread of life. We find there in the middle, we find the altar of incense. Now the altar of incense, it served as two purposes. One of the things, it was a picture and a type of the prayers of the intercession. It was the intercession altar is actually what it was. But the incense that they would burn would also have a twofold purpose. Not only would it represent the prayers that ascended up, and you see whenever the, oh, the incense would go up, the, the up above that was the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat which rested up on top of it. But the, the, all, the incense that would go up not only would serve as a picture and a type of the prayers, and you know Jesus is our intercessor, amen. The Bible says He ever liveth to make His intercession for us, amen. But it would also serve as a purpose to cover the smell of the sacrifices and the things that took place there as well. But we find Jesus in the altar of incense because He is our intercessor forevermore. The Bible says in Hebrews 7 and 25, Wherefore He is able to also save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. See, Jesus is praying for you. Amen? For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself, talking about Jesus, in the picture of the, that we see of him in the priest, the illustration of the priest going there and offering up, because the priest would offer daily sacrifices because they had to be cleansed every day. There had been an offering made every day, not just for His own sins, but for the sins of the people as well. And we find Jesus in the picture there in the altar of incense, the place that represented the prayers that go up. Amen? The intercession of some, and the, the prayers of the saints, the, but certainly more than anything, the prayers of our Redeemer. The intercession that Jesus made. We have no need for an altar of incense anymore because that was a picture, that was a type, that was a shadow that was showing us that which was to come, the great intercessor that would intercede on our behalf. That that would give a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. And it would not be man, but it would be His sacrifice, His Lamb, His, the Redeemer that He would send for mankind today. 
The next thing that we see there, and most of you, you, you can probably recognize it more than you can any of the other pieces. You might look at some of the other pieces of the tabernacle and think, well, I don't know what that is. But you certainly know what the candlestick looks like. Amen. And this candlestick, would, what do you do with the candlestick? You light it. It illuminates. It gives light. I was telling Brother Tyler before service this morning, without the candlestick, the priest would not have been able, would not have had light for the table of showbread. It illuminated the entire inner court. These seven candles here on this candlestick. And we find a picture of Jesus. He's, Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world in John 8 and 25. We find in Psalms 119 and 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We, if you want to bring it down even a little bit closer to where we're at and how we can understand it just a little bit better, think about what John saw in the first chapter of the book of Revelations. John said, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, Revelation 1 and 13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they had been burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. A picture of Jesus in the candlestick. A picture of Jesus in the brazen, in the uh, altar of incense. A picture of Jesus in the table of showbread, in the water laver, in the brazen altar. Every bit of that. And you, you can look at it a hundred different ways and still see Jesus. Oh, my, my, my. He's made it so plain and so simple that many times we just overlook it and think that there's got to be more to it than that. And trust me, there are teachers that can take you to each piece of this tabernacle, the layout of it, the covering of it, the material that was used, and they can teach it a lot better than I can. And they can, they can tell you a thousand different mysteries and a different things that goes along with this. But it doesn't take my whole, thank God He makes things simple for country preachers. It doesn't take looking very far to find Jesus in each one of these pieces of furniture. Now the last place that you would find in the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. And there was something that, that separated, there was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the inner court and the outer court. Inside this place, this would be the place where God's presence would dwell. This would be the place that the priest could only go in one time a year. He would go this do his other, this would be daily duties that he would do. But one time a year the priest would crawl under the veil and go in by here to place the blood on the mercy seat. To, to offer a one-time sacrifice for the sins of the people that would, be, that would be okay until the next year. He'd have to go in and do it again. And this would be, this, this, uh, this regiment or this, this uh, commandment that God made would be, have to be so specific that if this priest didn't do it just right, they'd have to drag him out dead. Because if it was not accepted to God, he would even have little bells on the hem of his garment so that as he went through the tabernacle, they could hear him doing his work. As he went into the Holy of Holies, because they couldn't see inside of there. That was where God's presence dwelt. God's presence had not been actually with man in, in this, this, this form right here since Adam and Eve messed up in the garden. There had been that separation. There had been that breach. It was still there. Even though God's presence was among them, they could not go inside there where God's presence was at because they would be consumed. But the priest would go in there once a year with those bells ringing on the bottom of his garment. Now can you imagine if the bells quit ringing, they think, oh no, the sacrifice was not Accepted. But he would go in there and inside the Holy of Holies you would find the Ark of the Covenant. On top of that would rest the mercy seat. Inside the Ark of the Covenant you would find the law that God gave to Moses. The written law which would represent Jesus said I have come to do what? Fulfill the law. All of the law fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This Holy of Holies, this Ark of the Covenant, this mercy seat represented the headship of God. The Bible says that the fullness of the Godhead rests where? In Jesus Christ. So this Holy of Holies, this presence, the Bible says, Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, my, my, my. How much plainer can it get? 
inside this Holy of Holies, this Ark of the Covenant, this headship of God, this presence of God that the priest could only, could only go into once a year. He couldn't dwell there. Couldn't stay there. Could only go in there once a year because there was a veil, and there was a veil that separated that. So God said, make me a tabernacle so that I can be with the people, so that my presence can be with the people. But the, it, it was there in their midst they couldn't fellowship with God. Do you see that this morning? God's presence was there in the form of the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, but man could not fellowship with Him. Just anybody off of the street couldn't think, well, I'm going to go into the Holy of Holies today and have a talk with God. They'd been struck dead. They couldn't do it. God had a way to do it. There's something else that you would find inside the Ark of the Covenant. You would find Moses' rod. It was actually Aaron's rod, the Bible calls it. Moses used it quite often. <laughs> but you would find Aaron's rod and why? Why Aaron's rod and no one else's? Because whenever it came time to decide who was going to be the priest, what line the priesthood was going to be, who it was it was going to be, which rod it was going to be that was going to be used, and what line as far as the tribe it would be that would be used for the priesthood, they would gather all the rods together and lay them down, and they would say, the one that buds, we're going to put them all together. And the one that buds, the one that brings forth life, that's the one. And they brought all of them together, and it was Aaron's rod that brought, and it would be just like as if I brought you this dead stick today. There's no life in this. This is just a piece of wood. But this rod miraculously brought forth life where there was no life. Amen? Just as Jesus there was a lot of men in his days, just as there was a lot of rods laid there before this, and in this, in this in this time when they would say, let's see which one of these rods is the one that God has ordained, the one that God would use. There was a lot of men. Jesus wasn't just no ordinary man. This would not be just some ordinary rod. This rod would bring forth life where there was no life. Jesus would say, I have the power to lay my life down and pick it up again. This rod that dwelt, that, that laid there in Inside of the, the Ark of the Covenant, this rod represents Jesus, life giver, miracle worker, extraordinary, God with us, God in the flesh, God, His deity, the deity of Jesus would be represented inside this Holy of Holies. His power, His might, His deity, the fact that He fulfilled the law. The fact that He was the only one to ever lay down His life and take it up again. Oh, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but not of his own. He didn't have the power to do it himself. It was Jesus who had the power of life and death in his hands to bring forth life where there was no life. So inside of this Holy of Holies, we see the Ark of the Covenant. We see the mercy seat. We see a lot of different things. We see the law inside there. And Jesus said, I am come to, to, not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law in Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus would say to them on His way to resurrect Lazarus, He would say in John 11 and 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So we find a picture of Jesus Christ in this tabernacle like none other. We find Him in each piece of furniture. We find Him in each detail that God would command Moses to use on this tabernacle, this earthly sanctuary that they would take from one place to the other, that God's presence would be in their midst. They couldn't fellowship with Him. They couldn't fellowship. They didn't want to. They were scared. They were afraid. They, were afraid. they would ask Moses at once. They said, you go talk to Him. We're scared. We're afraid to. Oh, but something was about to happen. Something we're going to look at this morning that will change that forever. You can find in Hebrews, the 8th chapter. I'm not going to read this. There's a lot of reading there. Hebrews, the 8th chapter and the ninth chapter. You'll find some of what I've been talking about. How that the Bible talks about Jesus. He compares Him to the priests of the Old Covenant. But it certainly describes Him as being the priest to a better covenant. No longer would there be need for earthly sacrifices of lambs and rams. 
No longer would there be need for the brazen altar. No longer would there be a need for the water laver. No longer would there be need for the table of showbread. No longer would there be need for the altar of incense. No longer would there be a need for the candlesticks. No longer would there be a need for the ark of the covenant because no, my, 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 because God's presence would dwell not only with man, but in man. Hallelujah. No longer would there be a need for this because Jesus would fulfill all that which was lacking. Jesus would fix that which was broke. Jesus would make it to where we no longer had to depend on a priest to take our needs before God. I hope you're out there listening. If you're Catholic, you caught that. No longer would there be a need for a man to stand in intercession for you Oh, there would be a God-man to stand in intercession for you. God in the flesh would be our intercessor, our mediator. So you can find a lot of that in Hebrews the 8th and the 9th chapter. I told you whenever we started this, when we were back over there in the Garden of Eden, y'all remember that? I told you that Adam, his sin breached, caused a breach between man and God in their fellowship. I told you how that Adam, when he sinned, him and Eve, I don't leave her out, when they sinned in the garden, how that they lost the glory, the righteousness of God that covered them. But I didn't stop there. I told you, Brother Sleece, how that one day, God Himself even testified to them in the garden of Eden, one day, there would come one that would restore the fellowship between God and and man. There would come one that would, that would restore the righteousness, the, the garment of righteousness from God that He had supplied. He would restore that once again to mankind. Remember what God told Moses there in Exodus the 25th chapter, the 8th verse. He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And they did, but not in His presence like Adam and Eve did. They were not able to fellowship with God like Adam did. They were not able to enjoy the presence of God like Adam did. They were not able to walk before God in righteousness like Adam did before the fall. They had to rely upon sacrifices made by man. Sacrifices that were not perfect but were just a substitute until the perfect thing, until the perfect one, excuse me Lord, until the perfect one would come along and offer his blood. So don't forget that God said, make me a sanctuary and make the Holy of Holies and put the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat in there so that my presence can be with man. And remember, here's God's presence, but man's all out here. Man, man couldn't go into God's presence. Even though they could say, they could look, brother, they could say, God's headship is there. You were a mistake. God's headship is there. His headship is in the Holy... His Spirit, His presence is in the Holy of Holies. But they couldn't just walk in there and say, whoa, I'm going to go in there and fellowship with God today. I'm going to go before God today. No, they couldn't do that. Even though His... See, it was there. But it was separated from them. There was something between them. Something that would keep them from going into the presence of God of God. Now let's look. Keep that in mind. The veil that separated man and God. All the blood of the listen, every blood of the lambs that Aaron and the priesthood would sacrifice on the brazen altar, none of that would make God's presence accessible to all of Israel. None of it. They couldn't go in there one day and say, this is, the per this is the red heifer we've been looking for. This is the perfect lamb. This is the one. And they sacrificed it. And all of a sudden, God's presence made way. You know, we can go into God's presence. Everyone is welcome in God's presence. No, that didn't happen until what we look at right now. Just on, on a hill outside of Calvary, where God Himself in the flesh has laid Himself down on the, per, on the, the, the authoritative, the final sacrificial altar, the cross of Calvary, we find Jesus Christ. Oh, don't miss this. If you've missed anything else that we've taught throughout this blood series, don't miss this. 
Matthew 27 and 50. Jesus hangs there about to pass away, about to die, about to give His life. Jesus would cry with a loud voice and yield up the ghost. And we know from the book of John, what He cried was, It is finished. He would cry aloud, It is finished. And He would give up the ghost. And the Bible says, Behold, the God's getting ready to announce something. Behold, <laughs> The veil of the temple. Whoa, wait a minute. The veil of the temple. The veil of the... What would, what would we just talk about? What, where's the veil at? The veil's right here. It keeps everybody else out from what? God's presence that was behind the veil. God's headship that was behind the veil. God's... Uh, uh, his, his, uh, his presence, His dwelling, his, his, the place where God dwelt. His holiness. His righteousness. Couldn't go any farther than that because you were not worthy. You were not good enough. You could not make it. If you went in there, you'd be killed. There was something that separated God's headship from man. There was something that separated God's presence from man. But the Bible says when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that the temple veil, what's it say about it? The veil remained the same and there was no way to get in unless you was a priest and you could only go in once a year. No, that's not what it says. The Bible says the veil of the temple was written twain from top to bottom six inches of cloth ripped as if it was a piece of paper when Jesus died on the cross why? because now that one that was prophesied of by God himself in the garden of Eden that would restore fellowship between God and man and would get, allow man once again to walk in God's presence now had come this is the promised Messiah this is God's stamp his final proof that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased he would rip the temple fail in half and it would open up God's holy of holies for all of mankind and the Bible says that we can now walk boldly into the throne room of God by way of grace we can now come boldly before His presence, before His throne. We no longer have to depend upon the Levitical priesthood. We no longer have to depend upon the blood of goats and that of earthly lambs. We no longer have to depend upon someone else. We no longer have to stand off afar and say over there is God's headship. Over there is God's... Prayer. Oh, no, now. Because of the blood. Because of the blood. Because of the blood. We can now walk boldly into the holy of holies, washed in the blood of the Lamb, walk forth in the righteous robes that Adam and Eve lost, the righteousness and Shekinah glory of God. We can now be born again. God inside of us. We can now walk forth in righteous robes and enter into the holy of holies with boldness. Not because we walk in there and say, I'm good enough. No more than those people in the Old Testament can walk in there and say, I'm good enough. If the priest, the one time of the year, he got to go in there. When he crawled in, if he just thought, I'm going in there because I've been, I've been good this year. Well, he would have never made it out alive. He went in by way of the substituted blood of the Lamb. You go in by way of God's perfect blood of the Lamb or you won't go. The veil's no longer there. Oh, you know, they might have got together. Well, hell, that earthquake done it. Let's sew the veil back up going about our business until the enemy would come and destroy the temple in whatever year it was. But the spiritual veil's gone. It's gone. There's a song that Mike Upright sings. I don't know if he wrote it or not. It says, the veil is gone. The veil is gone. We have access to the throne. The veil is gone. How important is the blood today? Well, you can't have any Fellowship with God. You can't have access to God without the blood. You can't go into God's presence without the blood. Because you're not worthy except through the blood. Only one way for you to be considered holy this morning. That's through the blood. It's not your church membership. It's not the good works that you've done. It's not how many times you've read the Bible. It's not how many, time, how many hours you spend in prayer a day. A lot of people have done that. It doesn't save you. Only through the blood. There was no way that anyone could go up through that tabernacle that we've just talked a little bit about and hadn't done it very good. But 
There's no way that someone could have went through there and said, well, I'm good enough. I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah, you're fixing, to be, you're fixing to suffer death, the penalty for doing your own thing. Not but one way, Jesus ripped the veil, His finished work. God rips the veil from top to bottom. Ripped asunder. A half a foot thick. Takes it and just rips it. No longer will man be separated from God as long as they come by way of the blood. Can't come up any other way. The Bible says if you try to, you're the same as a thief and a robber. But if you come by way of the blood, how important is the blood today? All oh, the blood's everything. Amen. That's why it upsets me so when people say, well, you know, to be saved, you, you first have to repent at an altar. And then we got to take you down and dip you in the river. And then we got to get you full of the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't, you're fixing to go to hell. You're crazy. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible teaches it's the blood plus nothing. Should we try to live right? Of course. How dumb would you be if you just thought, well, I'll just live any old hellish way. If you got that kind of attitude, I doubt very seriously you've ever been saved. But you've got to come to the realization sooner or later that what you do ain't good enough. You ain't good enough. You ain't never going to be good enough. That every one of us without God are nothing. Amen? God without man is still God. Man without God is nothing. Amen? We must come by way of the blood. The veil's gone. There's nothing anymore, no longer any ordinances and things keeping you from God. All you have to do is accept what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Put your faith <coughs> just as the children of Israel in Egypt, we talked about last week, put their faith in the blood of the Lamb that was on the doorpost. Put your faith in the blood of Jesus today. And that's enough. That's enough. He is sufficient. His blood is enough. There's no way we could talk from now until all of us are dead. And we could never expound enough on how important the blood of Jesus is. It is his faith. That's why when preachers lose their focus and take it off of Jesus, it Instead of preaching the cross, instead of preaching the blood, and I know we preach other things, but our center, our focus should always should always be centered around Jesus and His finished work at the cross because without that, none of the rest of it matters. We can talk about all the mysteries. We can talk about all the different things. None of it matters if you have not been by the way of the blood. Only through the blood will you make it. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by Him. And He was talking about His finished work that He would finish here on earth. All made possible by the blood. I'm closing. Hebrews the 4th chapter. Hebrews the 4th chapter says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All made possible by the blood. All made possible. And if you've listened to the last four sermons we preached, and you still don't realize how important the blood is, I can't help you any farther than that. I can pray that God shows it to you. I can pray that He reveals it to you. But I, it, I don't think I could say anything more than what we've said that would convince you, if you're not already convinced, that there's only one way, and that's by the blood of the Lamb. No other way. Your, your works are not good enough. Your penance is not good enough. Your deeds are not good enough. Any sacrifice you can make is not good enough. Only by way of the blood will you come. And if you don't come by way of the blood, you will not go. Someone else have something this morning before we go?